Hey there. Hey, Dave. Hey, welcome to welcome again uh, to uh, to really with Tom and Dave. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm wearing the shirt I wore last time. I'm wearing the same scarf because uh, this is becoming my this is becoming my uh, really uniform. It's still freezing uh, in my uh, office because this is yes. part two of our recap of our yes. trip to the Soul Foundation. Um, yes, the weekend. And you are still f- yes freezing like like Bob Cratchit. I am. Uh, it's it's shivery, and now it's like yes. nighttime outside, and my office is there's the I don't know for some reason maybe it's haunted. Maybe we should mm-hmm. do a paranormal episode because it's like twenty are you, degrees colder than any other part of my house. Yeah, be, it, and can you well, can you find a border of that cold spot like they do in uh, no, in uh, the, ha- the haunting? All, it's all cold, and it's like I write, and it's me. hard to write. I my my hands get cold. I get arthritis. It's you got to get those fingerless gloves that uh, Bob Cratchit wore. <laughs> <laughs> you're really you're really working the. It's like, well, I guess it's the holidays are approaching. Yeah, this is yeah. you know that's sort of appropriate. Yeah. Um, hey, let's like, without further ado, let's get, we, we left on a cliffhanger. I think we were about halfway we through day one because well, there's had, so much we, to we absorb. Had, we had covered page one. We'd covered, uh, which is, that's page, page one of day one. And, uh, that, that there, that was, I was off mic. They we did you. page one of day one. Mm-hmm. And now we can move on to page two of day one. Um, because there was just so many amazing people showed up for this thing. This was the um, uh, just uh, for th- and it, us. It, so amazing people and us. If you're dropping in on our episode for the first time or this channel, or you've stumbled into it I, by accident, you were looking for I don't know uh, how to do paper mache, and you just stumbled onto Really mm-hmm. with Tom and Dave. Please like and subscribe us. Um, yeah, you know it doesn't cost you anything, and uh, yeah, we would be thrilled and uh, be no. grateful. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe someone, maybe you're, you're listening to this on a dare. Yeah, um, sure. It, that could be it. Some, some, some but, sort of but, punishment. but you can't listen, but you can't listen to two old guy, white guys talk about UFOs for an hour, <laughs> but you can't. Hey, um, this is a great way to spend your time. Uh, yeah. so yeah, like, and subscribe really with Tom and Dave on our YouTube channel, uh, or mm-hmm. anywhere where your lovely podcasts yeah. are, are found. Uh, you can. Our teletype feed. Yeah. Just check yeah. us out on Instagram, or t- or TikToks, these kinds of mm-hmm. things. Spotify's. Yeah. I don't know where we are. Are we on that? Yeah. So, the Saul Foundation, just briefly, was is uh, put together by Stanford microbiologist Gary Nolan and Peter Scafish, who is an anthropologist, uh, and also and, and David Grush, David Grush, the famous now famous whistleblower. Um, intelligence officer, intelligence officer who worked for the Air Force and blew the whistle on reverse engineering programs inside our government. Um, this was a symposium, a think tank, sort of a two-day TED talk about how to prepare the Earth for disclosure, which mm-hmm. which is happening. No matter how you want to put your head in the sand, doubt it, refute it, debunk it, yeah. disclosure it is, it is a reality. Is happening. So yeah. the idea of like, are there things in the sky? Are the UFO like, yeah, yeah, it's real. And it's about 30 miles behind us in the rearview mirror because disclosure is underway. How to prepare yeah. religions, society people and it's not, the media we're not just talk, we're not just talking about machines weird machines in the sky we're talking about the revelation that there is uh, are that there are non-human intelligences on the earth interacting with humanity and um that our military and our government and private industry and uh, government contractors the military contractors people like Raytheon uh maybe Northrop Grumman uh Lockheed Martin um, these people are all involved, um, and with, uh, non-human intelligences and, and the non-human, uh, technologies. And if you think this is all just conspiracy theory, well, then maybe you should look at the Chuck Schumer amendment to the defense department budget, which lines it all up in gory detail, um, using the term non-human intelligence, um, over 17 times in this legislation, mm-hmm. and it is entitled the 2023 UAP Disclosure Act, or the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023. Um, yeah, it, and, it, and it outlines basically through its uh, 
the parameters of the legislation kind of outlines where uh what they think exists mm -hmm. the people writing the uh the legislation so we'll, which is we'll, we'll get which means oh, it's, it's, craft biologics which means bodies bodies people um alien people yeah, well, yeah alien people or whatever they are will um people from the future perhaps um there was a uh, talk that we'll get to later with uh uh, Carl Nell, who was a intelligence officer, also with the Air Force, who or naval naval intelligence, I'm not, who worked mm -hmm. with David Grush, the whistleblower, and he um, apparently was one of the architects of this legislation, and he gave a, I don't even know what to say. the The talk he gave was one of the most stunning. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, speeches of of sort of official disclosure I've ever I mean that I've heard that I think has maybe ever been given. Um, he walked us through the legislation and the whys and wherefores and hows. And though he did not rip the curtain yeah. back, he was just he, pounding he, on the curtain and laid out a potential time frame for disclosure, which isn't to say. And I think you know I know I've noticed on Twitter a lot of or not Twitter X whatever it's called. Uh, a lot of people getting hung up on the fact that he was saying disclosure would come in at twenty in twenty thirty, which isn't exactly what he was saying. He was saying that by twenty thirty, uh, everyone, all of humanity, would be living with a daily commonplace knowledge of non-human intelligences. Yeah, and he was uh, quite but, explicit but, yeah. in saying yeah. that disclosure is happening right now, and yes. that the name of the uh, legislation is not an accident. It is entitled the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, yes. people. And in its cover page, it says Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer, um, majority wrote, leader of the uh, Senate, not uh, yes. not a guy not, on not a, a late night radio show, um, you know. No. And uh, yeah, and not not uh, not a cab driver that you wish would just pull over and let you out. Um no, it's Chuck Schumer, yeah. uh, the uh, the uh, the majority leader in the Senate, fairly high profile um, government person, and and a pretty conservative politician. Uh, I mean, not in his politics, but but not a guy who's going off on on strange tangents. Not not at all. Um, um, but 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 so but he but his legis the cover page of it states that the American people in, in its in its presenting its reasons for the legislation. The American people have a right to know the truth about non-human intelligences. Plural. That's in the cover page. Uh, so yeah. So if you this think is so it's so fucked yeah. up, this is so fucked. Yeah. All really, I came away from this whole yeah. weekend was like, this is all so fucked up. I, it's just, it's. I mean, this is well, crazy. The, the I can't, amazing, how do I process the this? Thing is that is that maybe two percent of the population is is even at all aware of that this is going on? Maybe two percent. That's pretty. Uh, I think I'm being generous. Yeah, uh, I'm not the, sure. The vast the, bulk of humanity does not know this. Maybe is it's happening. a blessing that they're not paying attention. I mean, it's a sort of like it's. Well, otherwise, well, we wouldn't have gotten into the Soul Foundation Symposium if there was like more demand. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I'm kind of happy about it, to be honest. Um, the thing is, most of this symposium was spent grappling with the idea of disclosure, grappling with the effects of disclosure, arguing and debating over what type of disclosure is the least destructive to society. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't even getting into the motivations of whatever is flying around in our skies or living in our oceans or whatever the fuck it is, but it was mostly about just what will we do to ourselves uh, in the midst of this discovery yeah. that we are not at all alone in the universe and that it may just be living with us, among us, with its yeah. own plans and agendas. Um, yes. And it, and yeah, it was basically a, a very a practical look at, um, given that this is now not conjecture you know we're there to debate whether or not you know ufos exist or whether or not there are non-human intelligences everyone there was just going on the on the on the um uh on the basis that it is happening it is real it is true and since that is the case how do we prepare how do we mm -hmm. go forward how do we you know uh, communicate this to the public. How do we uh, galvanize the um, the government to um, to uh, to make this uh, public for, mm -hmm. for all the people? Yeah, what's the and, safest, least uh, you know, disruptive way to 
get everybody uh, used to this idea. What, what, what are the potential benefits and risks going mm -hmm. forward? Yes, there is a term so catastrophic disclosure, which was thrown around, um, yeah. which is like going running out into the street with your underwear, holding a your UFO and saying, I've got it, it's here, this is it, you know, and yeah. that's apparently is catastrophic. catastrophic so seldom modifies a good thing. Yeah. Uh, no, as, I mean, a, as, a, as, as an adjective. Felt Catast like a catastrophic, yeah. Can't go uh, well when you're cat in a catastrophic yeah. situation, but. Uh, um, like, oh, I had the most catastrophic <laughs> orgasm. Uh, it was amazing. No, you don't uh, use it in no. that context. I no. mean, you could. Yeah. Oh, I had I, one. Have I had a catastrophic been times. orgasm? I yeah. mean. I guess that's like when you like. <laughs> it's, gonna, yeah. it's like when you fart and have an orgasm. Is that what is, is that a catastrophic orgasm? Right? I don't know. I think no. I think it has to be worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we can only we can use our imagination. It has to be. Like, yeah, it has to be where you're just yeah you're you're quietly uh, calling a cab and <laughs> promising to never come back. Okay. Right. Well, that's uh, that's for another podcast. Um, yeah. When because uh, I want to hear all about that for sure, but. Um, the uh, the speakers that we left we so we had Jacques Vallée who came after Gary yes. Nolan, yeah. The uh, Jacques Vallée, the the great uh, French scientist and and, uh, and venture capitalist. I keep forgetting that. Stan I mean, yes, he's Stanford. He was he's this, he's he was an inventor. I mean, this this is a uh, story career. For Project Blue Book uh, with with uh, J. Allen Hynek. Mm -hmm. uh, he put together. He created the database for and organized all of the files. For Project Blue Book, uh, he's also was, uh, I believe, instrumental in helping to uh, 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 design the internet. Just that he was involved with that, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you throw that in, yeah, it was uh, he, he travels. Venture capitalist. He, he's like the Frenchman. The, yeah, he's French, which uh, yeah. shouldn't be a strike against him. He he travels like the no. Pope in that at that event. I mean, he was. He yeah. was just surrounded by an entourage. He's this sort of. I didn't even have the nerve to go up. Did you go up to him? No, I didn't. Yeah. The two people I didn't, I didn't work up the courage to talk to were Jacques Vallée and uh, Hal Putoff. Those are the two yes. people. Yeah, yeah. Hal Putoff, and, who, and they both seemed very pleasant. Like Everybody nice seemed people. pleasant. Everybody be, seemed very nice. China exactly was the problem. It's not like Gary Nolan who hates us. I um, know. Don't hate us, Gary. We we love you. Um, uh, yeah. But yes, unrequited love is still love. It's still love. It's still love, yeah. and he's uh, and he's done a good thing putting this whole thing together. Um, yeah, he should be on that big panel that they put together for the the yeah. Oh, definitely the, uh, nine. the, the he's got to be the, the guy. nine person. Yeah, the nine person panel. Yes. Well, I guess we should explain that to people who might not know that in the legislation uh, before we get to Jacques Vallée uh, that Chuck Schumer wrote uh, along with. Um, who was uh, Rounds, uh, Senator, Senator Mike Rounds, Rounds yeah. who's a, rep yeah, a Republican, co-authored it. Um, because again, all the UFO legislation is bipartisan and uh, unanimous in its uh, various committees. Uh, and this has been already been passed out of the Senate, this, uh, this legislation. Yeah, they're, it's just waiting. They're fearful uh, that the House is going to try House. to kill it. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Mike, uh, another Mike um, from... Uh, Ohio. From Ohio. Yeah, the Wright Patterson, Mike, uh, there's Mike Rogers and then Mike. Um, Mike Rogers. Yeah. Mike Rounds is actually on board, help write it, uh, Republican. Turner. And, uh, Mike Turner. Mike Turner is the one who uh, whose uh, district includes uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah, the fix is, where, the fix is in. Was, we'll see if yeah, they succeed. Uh, Hopefully they don't succeed, but. Um, but uh, but anyway, there's going to be a nine person panel set up under this legislation that will uh, review anything that the military and the intelligence community wants to keep uh, classified about UAP, because the legislation uh, uh, automatically declassifies all information related to UAP, uh, craft materials, biologics, um, non human. Evidence of non-human technology. You're right. It assumes declassification, and then they have to go yeah. about deciding why stuff needs to be classified. I mean, this is going to be they have to make an argument. Yeah, they have to make an argument to keep it classified. And if they can't convince the panel, uh, then it becomes uh, declassified. Could be like a pack and, of and, wild and, dogs going at this thing. Yes, but. and the president has to sign off on all of these. These what the, the panel decides and the panel is so going to be like it's going to have people from the humanities from the sciences from anthropology the the you know there's there's a whole kind of 
It's uh, mm-hmm. it's right out of Contact. It's yeah. right out of Arthur and, C. Clarke. Yes. And for some reason, uh, one guy that plays Spoons. I thought that was weird. Yeah. I thought that was weird. But, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, you know, I'm not here making policy. It's not an easy craft, though. I mean, it's not yeah. easy to play Spoons. No, it sounds, you know, you think it's easy, but it's not. Try it. No, you know? Completely. I understand. Yeah. Um, so Jacques Vallée was the next speaker. And he, um, he, he also the... Yeah, the 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 famous UFO researcher, writ, author of dozens of books. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, he's and and the and of course we should for people who don't know, he was the person that the French researcher in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, played by uh, Francois Truffaut, who, if you don't know, is a French director. Um, Jacques Vallée is cooler. The, the Nouvelle Vague. Yeah, uh, but that character was based on Jacques Vallée. Yes, and. Uh... It's a good movie. If you haven't seen it, holds it up. Is, it's a great, it's a great movie, and it was based on a lot of stuff that uh, um, you're talking about that, here. Uh, J. Allen Hynek uh, and Jacques Vallée told uh, Steven Spielberg about the phenomena. So, uh, what did you think of his speech? I, it was a little bit kind of overview. Like I didn't have a ton of specifics written down. I, there was a, the story about the frog. Yes, uh, uh, which is a pretty good joke. I don't usually like jokes, but it's a pretty good joke. It's pretty good. Do you want to? Do you want to tell yeah. it? Do you remember it? The joke. Well, I I think I can I can remember it. There was a it's a story of an an older man was walking uh, down the street and uh, he sees off the side of the road he sees this uh, he sees the frog and, uh, and then he notices that the frog is is wearing a a golden crown a little golden crown and he goes down and he picks up the frog and he's looking at this little this frog with a golden crown and then the, it turns out the frog can talk. And the frog says to him, I'm not really a frog. In reality, I am a beautiful princess. And if you will kiss me, I will be restored to my human form. And we will live as man and wife happily forever and ever. And we will have children and everything will be great. And we'll have children. It'll be good. And the man looks at the frog. He's an older man. And he he says, uh, you know what? At my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. Yes, which was his analogy for the whole UAP government conversation, I think, was mm-hmm. was sort of his yeah. approach there, which I thought was interesting and sort of like they don't kind of want to be bothered at this stage or they just sort of were hoping it would just kind of, you know, it's too complicated to get into. Um, to get to the truth, to get back to the reality. Yeah. To, yeah. And so, to, get, to get to the beautiful princess. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was interesting. That, I mean, I would say... Uh, the it was it was it was it was sort of like I don't know felt like a little passing of the torch. Do you know what I mean? Like it seemed like he those assembled were uh, in the nuts and bolts of it, and he was he had been kind of carrying this uh, for for decades, and you know mm-hmm. it seemed to be a ch- time to honor him and honor his legacy and continue the work and move forward. It was really, I mean, it was, it was lovely. Gary Nolan's introduction, he was very emotional introducing Jacques Vallée. Obviously, uh, they he's, you know, Jacques Vallée's had a huge impact on Gary Nolan's interest in this work uh, and it, you know, influenced it. And they've obviously been in, you know, uh, communicating uh, in terms of getting him materials or things that um, Jacques Vallée has collected through the years. So it was a very, um, just a lot of good emotional energy there and and um, incredibly cool to yeah. see him and hear I, him speak. I think it's f- fair to say, yeah, that Jacques Vallée is probably one of the most sort of important, um, not just researchers uh, in UFOs and, or UAP uh, and, you know, the related phenomena, but also one of the most important thinkers. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the subject, you know, that he's, you know, that he sort of, sort of, uh, philosophized and theorized about what this all could mean and, and what, you know, what could be behind the phenomena, um, you know, in a way that I think was, uh, way ahead of everybody else and everyone, everyone in the field acknowledges a great debt to Jacques Vallée, uh, for, for broadening the discussion yeah, and giving it and, and, uh, bringing a seriousness, uh, an academic seriousness to the subject, uh, you know, and a, a very sort of, a, uh, you know, a science-based uh, approach. Yes. Respected for decades on this topic when it was not easy to be respected on this topic. And, yeah. and yeah. you know, really, he's a visionary and someone who has, um, like I said, just 
you know, yeah. maintained this, kept its, you know, the credibility and legitimacy of this topic as it is now entering dis- whatever, mm-hmm. no matter how hard the media tries to resist it, it is entering the bloodstream yeah. as... And, and on top of that, he's also one of the great practitioners of frog-based humor. Which is not an easy... It's not a... That's no. not easy to pull off, um, which is why I had you tell the, the, the frog princess joke. But um, following him was Dr. Diane Pasulka. Yes, who who one of the people who does who acknowledges his influence? She does, and and, she, and you've read more of her. Um, I've read I have read uh, her book uh, American Cosmic, which is a very interesting. She is a a, a religious uh, studies professor. Yes, uh, one of several in, sort of dealing with this yes, arena of the topic teach, where she teaches. Um, she's yeah, um, and she's she wrote a book. Uh, I guess her, her field of expertise is studying, you know, re, you know, religious phenomena and um, texts and uh, its, in, you know, its impacts on culture, and uh, um, and uh, but you know, but as she said, it's in religious studies, you, you know, they don't study, you know, whether or not religion is true or not. They just sort of look at its, you know, how religions develop and what their impact is on on humanity. Mm-hmm. And so she decided um, that she was going to that she she her belief was that that uh, uh, the UFO community she thought was a, the beginning stages of a new religion forming, and she wanted to go out and study this new religion as it was being um, formalized and developed culturally. And she went out and started researching it, and then she found, to her astonishment, that that wasn't exactly the case. Mm. Okay. That she started interviewing scientists and uh, and uh, people in military and uh, particularly a lot of scientists that she met, uh, who uh, revealed to her that no, it's not uh, just a a belief system. Uh, it's it's about things that are really happening. Mm-hmm. It's about real craft uh, and real impacts and real uh, real evidence and. Um, and so that so that took her sort of outside of her original sort of comfort zone of this being just a culturally interesting phenomena uh, of human, basically of human origin. And she realized, no, there's all these scientists that are actually interacting with this technology and uh, interact and sort of uh, involve with uh, the UAP issue at, at a very deep level and are doing um, – interesting and secret work on it like you know most people that she was uh like an american cosmic um she sort of it's part of it's kind of like a road uh story of traveling with this uh, the scientist who she calls james in american cosmic who uh after the book Turns came out, out was gary nolan uh the found, one of the three founders of the uh, soul foundation and the molecular biologist at she Stanford told, university. She told a crazy story that I, I, I think you're, and you're doing a great job of kind of encapsulating her, her, her journey. I, I found her speech a little, uh, her talk was a little hard for me to follow a little bit of super interesting. But the one thing that I was like, holy smokes was, I mean, her, her theme had to do with fire from the gods. It had to do with the myth of Prometheus. It had to do with the myth of mm-hmm. Frankenstein. It had to do with, well, I think arguably the literalization of some of these myths. You know, it seems like mm-hmm. the the deeper we go into the technology of this, the irony is, is that it, it, it is seeming to bring us closer to these most basic basic myths that define us and define yes. our religions and, and our cultures. Yes. And the notion that they aren't, uh, you know, I think that they aren't metaphor. They aren't purely metaphor. No. Uh, that that the, the the tales of miracles um, may uh, actually have some uh, a basis to them, in the same way that we are basically uh, witnessing what appear to me miraculous events in the UAP field. And you, um, you may know more about this than I do, but she was talking about this trip she took with Gary Nolan, which they were taken by another person who I guess was in the intelligence field. They were blindfolded. Yes. I believe they were in New Mexico. They were in New Mexico. Yes. And they were blindfolded by, I guess, a, someone that 
I think she his the pseudonym for him was Taylor P. I believe. And I taken have, to and he's still it's still is that identity. Still is Taylor still P. Secret. And taken to a crash site. Yes, that is in the, New Mexico. In New Mexico, which isn't the Roswell site. Not Roswell. we know that it wasn't the Roswell site, but it is a crash site that's called in New Mexico from the forties that they called the donation. The donation site, yeah, the donation site. I think, right? Yeah, and and they call it that because it just seemed like this thing was just left there for them to like pick up and go study. Apparently, um, yeah. Which just and in fact, Gary Gary Nolan went out into this field and found material that he is now studying, and led to this that, group of researchers called the Invisibles. Yes, yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's what uh, Diana Pasolka's she she dubbed them the Invisibles. Fair enough. Uh, which of course tend. To, it turns out to have a parallel in something that uh, uh, J. Allen Hynek referred to the Invisible College, right? Which was the group of scientists back in the uh, you know fifties and sixties who were secretly working on the UFO problem, uh, but were not doing it publicly because it was career suicide and they couldn't. And of course, uh, J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée were parts were part of the Invisible College. Um, Two of the only people that were sort of public about it. In fact, uh, Jacques Vallée wrote a book called *The Invisible College*, which I have not read mm. because I'm not a very well-read man. You're a very um, well-read man, but you can't. It's hard to get to all of these, and there's a lot of yeah. you know. There's a lot yes. of good sort of material on this yeah. topic, and a lot of but great Diana, research has been done. Yeah. So Diana Pazalka referred to all these scientists who are working um, at high levels with uh, in secretive parts of, uh, I think, government and academia. Uh, on um, on the UAP or UFO uh, issue, and you know, and doing scientific research, and as she said, actually coming up with uh, creating uh, products, creating um, um, actual wealth mm. from some of these researches that they're doing. That they're you know they're they're make making advancements. Which would Scientific make a lot of sense of why they don't want to let go of them. Yeah, yeah. If these are so, happening in some of these, uh, some of these uh, aerospace companies, um, that there's yeah, there there's stuff yeah. they're actually getting out of it. There was uh, a lot of talk. Uh, David Grush, the whistleblower, was on Rogan, and they were talking about fi that fiber optics may have been discovered well, through reverse engineered yeah, materials. Well, that's the basis of where do I have it? Somewhere around here, I've got the. Um, You'll never um, find it. You'll oh, never there it is. find it. There it is. There it is. I know. I get alpha. I get alpha at my books some, at it's some point. It's a snake. It would have bit you. Them. But there it is. The day after Roswell, uh, written by Colonel Philip J. Corso, hmm. uh, retired, um, uh, along with uh, uh, an author, William J. Burns. They all start talking after they're retired. Yes. And what he talked about was that uh, in the sixties. I mean, again, he's a guy who worked on. He worked with directly with. Uh, with Eisenhower during the Second World War, he was apparently a liaison with uh, um, a priest who would later become Pope um, during the war. Um, so cool and, friends. Yes, and and then in the uh, in the sixties, uh, he was given this portfolio. Um, you know, he's an intelligence officer again. He, again, he had briefed the president. He has lots of photos of him, like at the White House. Um, Basically, he was given a, a filing cabinet. He was told, "Here, you know, look at this this cat filing cabinet. Go through it and uh, look at the material that's in there, and then uh, see what you can what you can make of it." And basically, he was told that there was basically artifacts in there from the Roswell crash, and and if there was anything in there that uh, scientists were currently working on anything similar to it, sort of feed this this recovered material to them. So like say he, they had something, you know, they were researchers who were trying to develop something like, um, fiber optics. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, like we got, we got these, these technologies wholesale from the craft, from the material, but that there would be a scientist working on something like fiber optics. And Philip Corso's job was to take these things from the, from his filing cabinet and say, here, have a look at this. Maybe this will give you some indications of where you should go in developing mm, this tech. Okay. And so that basically was, uh, you know, uh, apparently also had something like a, a microchip, uh, you know, oh. uh, that they would 
take to people who were working on developing microchips. Mm. Uh, but so so that the uh, feeding this stuff into industry uh, as it was, you know, progressing and kind of accelerating the pace in those industries. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the story of this book. Um, and, and more or less that, sort of what she was referencing in her, in her uh, talk and, um, and some of the, some of the things I just, I've wrote, written down here, how do we communicate with post biologicals? Um, which I, I'm just randomly throwing out there from her speech, but yeah. it's like one of those things of like, okay, I need to just, I need to just stop and absorb for a minute. I don't know how do we communicate with the post biologicals. I guess our yeah. baby AI will help us do that. Um, there are days when I wake up and I feel a bit like I am a post biological. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. It's cold yeah. in my office. I'm feeling very. I'm yeah. approaching post biology right now. Yeah, um, but it's tr- yeah. So yeah, so it was yeah, and that these that these are the things. These are the sort of, I guess, potential future tech that people are working on. And she believes there needs to be a new fourth realm of learning that uh, she was calling the emergent phenomenon. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it was very cool and and led into um, one of the more academic discussions, um, which was Peter Scapish, who's the uh, sort of... Uh, Third point of the triangle, the Saul Foundation founders um, mm-hmm. gave a very interesting speech about con- about conceptualizing non-human intelligence. Um, yes, and, and d- divorcing ourselves of our anthropocentric or anthropomorphizing. There was a lot of anthropomorphizing yeah. talk, which, I, I, I mean, essentially he was asking what about us pre- prevents us from conceiving of these UAP because they are not mm. uh, simply technology. And and even though the overall focus of the military and the intelligence apparatus and the legislation, everything is really focused on kind of the technology or what was found in the crap. But he was saying that that um, this was these are really like bio machines that consciousness can't be taken out of the equation. There is some there is there is some uh, unity in what yeah, these be- things are that yeah uh, between between the craft and the biologics yeah that there's something in about consciousness and these materials that in our uh, modern world we simply don't have the tools anymore to understand what they could be and he was sort of saying that since the 17th century um as we have sort of broken the world yeah. in our modern brains into these domains, yes. domains of the, art yes. and politics the, and the Cartesian re- revolution. Yes. Of, and I economy guess. and religion. We, we have sort of, um, in the process made it less, made ourselves less capable of even understanding what could be going on. And he equated it back to kind of, I guess the an animism and the, uh, the, uh, the approach of looking at things like um, a, a world where the minerals and the hillsides and the trees have politics and have art and have religion and, you know, and, and really like he was, he was doing that kind of deep dive and um, yeah. of just sort of indigenous thought and uh, self-conscious, yeah, we, we- self-conscious, plants and rocks and, yeah. and and that sort of world that might, might we, be... we've divorced ourselves from magical sure. uh, notions i guess uh yeah that, that we may need to reacquaint ourselves with the idea of magic because whatever the, the these the whatever these entities are and whatever their technology is is something that you know as arthur c clark said you know sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic Sure, and also probably would save us some ontological shock because these cultures tend to we're we're kind of living with this these ideas um, in ways that we are not and and yes, we do of, not of, of yeah of of um, you know the like the indigenous uh, religions often you know talk about you know uh, beings you know non non corporeal beings beings from other dimensions uh, star people. You know, and the fact that these, you know, that these uh, notions show up in 
you know, in, you know, uh, the peoples that lived in, you know, New Mexico and, you know, California mm -hmm. and Texas. And they also show up in Australia. Um, and those ideas, ideas have been around for thousands of years. Mm hmm. Yeah, there was, and, uh, there was, there was, it was a lot to chew on because there, I mean, just yes. some of the stuff I wrote here, like thought, exper you know, that sentience is way more ubiquitous than we might realize or understand, um, mm -hmm. a kind of a promiscuous sentience, uh, yes. a kind of unimaginable body. We could be dealing with a UAP collective. We could be dealing with some sort of mind collective, um, you know, uh, and and so he 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 thinks we just need to start trying to now. I, I there was a little bit of a him saying, so everything that you're saying, all these talks, it's all great, uh, but it's all meaningless because we can't really conceive of what's going on. So there was a little bit of that where I was like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think there's yeah. some wisdom happening here that, and I don't think that was probably his, his overall point, but um, it was yeah. funny for an inch for a minute, like uh, yeah, sort of another academic came up and they were battling over like the Hegelian world. And then Peter Scaife said, we weren't going to be talking about Hegel here. And it was a whole, yeah, they, they, it almost came to blows. <laughs> it, was, it was getting, but, but, but very, very academic blows. Yeah, it was I don't a, think anyone a little horribly hurt. A little testy, yeah. a little testy over the yeah. philosophers, but uh very kind yeah. of, again, um, really interesting sort of grapple with, uh, with yeah. the odd and, and the very, very, very weird, um uh, the, the 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 deeper you go the the weirder and more diffuse and difficult to mm. define this phenomenon is um yeah and he and it, all, it also kind of winds back into like D Diana Pazalka's view which is that you know she has been in her religious studies you know um and in a sense the catholic church is very prepared for non-human intelligences mm -hmm. because they it's basically core to their beliefs mm -hmm. you know angels and demons you know are are non-human intelligences that exist in another dimension um and that's you know that's something that catholics believe wholeheartedly um which goes back to but, this literalization of the myths you know where uh mm -hmm. these these yeah i find that i found that one of the sort of strangest ideas to climb on top of was just how much closer it is bringing us to these very original stories that um uh, may have just much more kind of potency than uh, I would have ever yeah. thought of the future, you know. But yeah. the future and is bringing us closer to our past. Materialist atheist, I, you know, it's it's hard, really it's hard, hard for, you. Yeah. for me to swallow. Yeah, um, you know, and I still cling to that. I think to me, it you know, the uh, my uh, my nice my my convenient exit is I can go well, well, yeah, all right, all those those stories may be true, but I think it's because. Uh, the reality behind them is the same reality that's behind what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It is these non-human intelligences. Mm -hmm. It is possibly aliens or pan-dimensional beings that, that basically um, that we interpreted in the past as angels and demons, you know? Yeah. And, and now it's, I think it's the same thing that we're encountering, but in the past we didn't have a technological way of viewing the world. We didn't have, uh, you know, sufficiently advanced science, so our, you know, our default uh, way of thinking before the scientific revolution of the 1700s, I guess, um, was, was magic. Um, you know, I mean, you know, there, you know, people would debate how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. Yes. You know, and it wasn't, you know, it would be serious debates. It was our, it. yeah, we, we were working with our capacity to comprehend at the time and yet obviously we mm -hmm. were they they were working with some some basis uh in fact which is yeah the, eye the, popping yeah, in itself were, people yeah people were witnessing events you know going go and you know obviously there's records of it going through you know back to the times of the roman empire of uh you know flaming shields mm -hmm. in the in the air over over battlefields well uh you know that were are documented they seem to be curious uh, about us when we kill each other uh yeah which i guess would be of interest you know as opposed to you know my morning routine which is not as yeah. not as interesting 
Um, well, historically, we've we've been pretty entertained by us killing each other as well. Good point. Yes, you know, know. yeah. Um, we, which leads us. Well, I'll share one really. <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate for me to share this, but um, this is what it was like being at the conference. And I won't give away who. Yeah. I I will say I, I was walking to the restroom and I observed a hushed conversation underway. <laughs> And mm-hmm. and I won't share who was having the conversation with who, uh, but it was one of the luminaries with one of the audience members, but it was being whispered about. And as I walked past, this is what I heard. Uh, well, the uh, autopsy photos are, are authentic. And I kept walking and it was it was somebody that would be in the position to know this. And I was, I stopped. I was like, I, I, do I dive into this? conversation has nothing to do with me i want what photos are we talking about what is this was sort of the kind of thing that was going on there of like you're um but uh i yeah i went and then probably couldn't pee because i was so preoccupied with what i had just heard but it was well i heard i heard a similar thing with somebody else talking about how they they were asked uh somebody i forget who it was maybe it was a one uh who was sitting next to us uh um another another uh, uh ufo guy um, asked Hal Putoff if one of the reasons that uh, they uh, they won't come forward about Roswell is that in order to uh, to to be uh, to, uh, to to discuss Roswell openly, and they would have to then disclose um, the uh, the hybrid breeding programs. Yeah, that would be bad. And uh, and and apparently, uh, Hal Putoff said, well, "There's something to that." <laughs> yeah, there was there were a few, you know, again jaw dropping statements that that were um, again these are these are the gatekeepers. I mean, a lot of these people are gatekeepers. They have been involved in intelligence yeah. and with the government and military on all of these projects, some of them going back 40 years um, with, yeah. uh, you know, the, yeah. so Hal put off from yeah. muscle tar and, and, and the people you know, that you know. are, the people that were at this conference. Now there were other people that were not at this conference, notable people. Um, but those that were there, one are, a lot of them are, as they say, read in. Um, they, they Mm -hmm. made it clear that they weren't going to share classified information at this symposium. They made it clear it wasn't okay to share classified information at this symposium, but this, there was so much crazy inference. I mean, we were dancing around the topic to the point that like, there is an absolute given at this conference that there's, that there's ships, you know, that there are ships, that there's technology, uh, that the writers of the legislation know about it as you said Dave mm-hmm. non-human intelligence says that yeah. there is a um plural to this that, yeah. um going back to your angels and demons statement and the one thing that this panel with Leslie Kane and Hal Putoff and Larry McGuire your fellow Canadian yes um yeah which also mentioned but leslie kane of course is oh. the one of the authors of the 2017 new york yes. times uh you know the sunday sunday times front page story about uh ufos and glowing auras and secret projects talk about that, a luminary uh, at this point and broke the grush story at the debrief um yes she and ralph she blumenthal and, uh, ralph blumenthal and both um, guests of the really podcast like and subscribe yes. if you enjoy what you're hearing because we yes. bring you all the finest in uh of, of uap superstars yes and les and leslie is um you know, there's, you know, there's a, is, 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 is one of the gravitational centers of the UAP, uh, community. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. she had a panel. So, and so how Dr. Hal put off is a, is a physicist who has been sort of behind the scenes for half a century, uh, dealing with this, it seems, um, dealing with these various programs and studies and Larry McGuire is a, now, what would be his equivalent in U.S. politics? Um, uh, well, he's a member of parliament, so it would be, you know, it would be, um, it would be like being a, a a congressman. Okay, all right, or, so uh, or a senator. Yeah. Um, so it was very cool that he was here at this event, closer to Congress. Yeah, uh, yeah, House of Representatives. Yeah. So he's yeah he's a uh, representative in of um of a riding as we call them in uh, Manitoba, I believe. Okay. Um. Yes, but he is a yeah he's a member of parliament, 
Um, and yeah, so and uh, and he's uh, the only uh, member of Canadian government uh, who seems to be interested in in getting Canada to address this issue. And he's the only one seems to be pushing. Yeah, Canada is definitely lagging way behind. Slow the US, to the so game, it's... like what is you know? And this is not again like one of the things we've also been learning. This is not a a U.S thing this is a global thing well, that yeah. the, that the reason disclosure hasn't been happening is because of a cold war arms race of this material and who has it and who's learning from it and that that's one of the biggest issues it was talked about incessantly throughout these two days about this idea of other you know how do we negotiate with our partners how do we make this international how do we not make this an arms race how do we um, mm -hmm. you know, there were suggestions of like, don't call it another Manhattan project. We should call it a, another CERN project based on the sort of chem, you know, the particle accelerator so that it feels more pure science than something militaristic or something that we need to yes, win a war over. Yeah. Um, something that ex excludes the rest of the world, you know? Yeah. And, and that was a, a, a big part of several talks, but this, some of the highlights of this, of this one was, um, Al Putoff shared the fact that in 1969, when Blue Book was shut down, the truth was is that in that same memo that shut down Blue Book, um, it opened an entirely different study and uh, renewed the work. So again, a sort of very clear example of the government sort of saying one thing to the public and doing the exact op opposite as it relates to this topic mm -hmm. by continuing the research and he told um, a story that he was called by a top uh, intelligence person to participate in a, a study uh, that he said would be the most important work he ever does, the most important meeting he would ever go to. Uh, he was presented with a hypothetical, which was, let's say that Russia, China, and the U.S. all had crashes that they were retrieved, you know, UAP, UF, UFOs at the time, let's say. Mm -hmm. And saucers. And he um and he was asked with this other sort of group of kind of scientists and whatnot in this very secret meeting to basically come up with a disclosure plan. Do we disclose to the public? How do we disclose to the public? And they were mm -hmm. asked to to vote on it. Um and yeah, they, they had to give an a um a, a positive negative score of uh of either plus nine or minus nine of a number of on a number of different issues right it was sort yes. of like how how this would impact various how, parts yeah, how of the would world affect, yeah how would it affect the stock market how would it affect religions how would it affect you know you know it said how and even down to uh how would what if one company has possession of these materials and another company doesn't? How do we equalize that? Yeah, and if they can you know, sue would, or if they could yeah, unfair advantage. advantage. Yeah, and so he he said that uh, even though most of the people s there were inclined to disclosure or were you know sort of that was mm -hmm. that was their kind of default uh, state of mind. Yeah, but they would all tally their plus minus yeah. scores, and they all ended up against disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they all came up with the negative scores. Yeah, which and then apparently there were other groups separately that were went through the same exercise, mm -hmm. like multiple other groups of of scientists or, or whatever. And I wrote in my um, notes, so it sounds like all, Hal Putoff's responsible for uh, non disclosure. I was, it was essentially kind of him coming <laughs> yeah. clean, and I was like, thanks, Hal. Um, mm -hmm. He is a uh, he's a really fascinating guy, and was and was definitely. Yes, and one of these, also, one of these real, was, you know, he was he was part of the Stanford Research Institute's uh, uh, famous work on remote viewing mm. as well, along with Russell Targ, who was also there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so he's you know um, he's been involved with a lot of very interesting things, and he was and he was you know, and I think he was involved with OSAP, and uh, I think he may have worked on NIDS as well. Uh, and um, and he said at one course, okay go ahead and he was and he was also a um, a member of the to the stars academy when it launched along with Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and um, Jim Semivan and uh, who else was there um, oh somebody from Skunk Skunkworks I forget his name he uh, yeah I don't know who that was Lukatsky 
No, it wasn't Lukaski. It was somebody I can't remember. Because a couple of things that he said, like but I remembered a bunch of names, and that's really good for me. I was proud of you. I mean, you were yeah, rattling them off there. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things he I said, only know your name because it's on the screen. Yeah. So I'm I'm the yeah. Tom part of the Tom yeah. and, uh, Tom and Dave. Uh, he said that they knew that there were UAP UFOs being housed. That he became aware of this. Um, I'm going to paraphrase because again, he was doing this sort of like he did a lot of dancing around the 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 UFOs thing in terms of the, the what we have. But he he said that they wanted to go to uh, around the world, around the globe, um, to all these experts to essentially ask them to uh, imagine 50 years in the future of their sciences. Um, to kind of project what those sciences might be, I think in an effort to help those trying to reverse engineer. And what Hal Putoff wanted to do was was basically bring them the ships, show them the materials, and just and and help get help trying to figure out what this stuff was. So I'm telling the story a little bit in reverse. So mm-hmm. essentially, what happened is like they wanted to bring these ships. They knew there were ships. They were told there were ships that we were trying to figure them out. But when they went to to try to get the material, they said, oh, well, no, this is so compartmentalized. It's been broken yeah. down into so many pieces. There is absolutely no way to create a whole. There is no way to share all the data together. That is impossible. There's no way we can do it. So they were sent out with how I started the story with this false story to essentially ask to try to get these guys to give them information like, OK, imagine 50 years in the future, your science is how, you know. What would that look like to to essentially help them break it down? Um, but he did bring up this very very important revelation, something that James Lakatsky, who is a who is his boss in these this sort of research in OSAP. OSAP. Yeah, James Lakatsky was the man who put OSAP together, and he has recently come forward with the book we talked about with George Knapp. And he talked about it with George and Jeremy Mm -hmm. with Colm Kelleher, which is this book, which is Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations, published by the Defense Department. Um, Mm -hmm. And and, and for one thing, for people who still think that things like the Tic Tac event are debunked, read the chapter on the initial the initial analysis of the Tic Tac event. It's pretty amazing. And but then an even more amazing thing, and I'll let you tell it. No, I mean it it he says in this book, he even says on the back here, these things are so redacted and fucked with with the defense like the the wording is so insane, but yeah, the, to to meet their Dobser uh, requirements. <laughs> the big reveal, I, the grammar I can't even but he stated that the United States was in possession of a craft of unknown origin. He states the United States was in possession of a craft of unknown origin and had successfully gained access to its interior. The craft had streamlined mm-hmm. configuration suitable for aerodynamic flight, but no intakes, exhaust, wings, or control services. It appeared not to have an engine, fuel tanks, or fuel. What was the purpose of this craft, Lukatsky asked. And Hal Putoff spoke about talking with Lukatsky, who would apparently share no more information about this for yes, classified which we saw reasons. George. George and Jeremy torturously tried Oof. to get him to go beyond what yes. was written in the book. Uh, they did everything the, they could. Uh, on the Weaponized podcast. But and, this uh, is disclosure. And, yeah. And, and Lukatsky, he's an, he's an intelligence man. Mm-hmm. That's what he, he is. You know, he's also a scientist, but he's an intelligence officer. And he said, I, you know, what is, what is in the book is what I'm authorized to, I was authorized to say, and, I, and that's as far as I'm going to go. And what Hal Putoff said was, if Lukaski says we have a craft, you can absolutely take it to the bank, was his yes. big quote. And he said also, uh, the, said the same thing about David Grush. Yes, he did. He vouched for him, and he said that if Grush said this, that you can also absolutely take it to the bank. Right bank, he said. Lukatsky would know. Yeah. He was inside it. He ran the program. Yeah. That... And imagine how confused the people at that bank are going to be. And people, there's going to be a rush. Yeah. What do you? Why are you? Why did you take this to me? Yeah. I'm a banker. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, but it was. Uh, he says Lukatsky was the uh, highly responsible intelligence official. That he was absolutely would, and that um, it sounds like he 
we've been inside it. We've been inside a ship, and this was according. This was yeah. part of the fascinating so panel. Yeah. So people keep, you know, people, of course, you know, har- keep harping on. Well, you know, everything Grush has is secondhand. It's just hearsay. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, here we have James Lukatsky, mm-hmm. hands on, says hands on. We yeah, they're not to. conspiracy theorists. They're not people with yeah. a reality show. They're not do it. They are intelligence officials cleared at the highest mm. highest levels of government sharing this information. With a science background <laughs> with PhDs. Yeah. Um so it's not coming from us. We're just reporting the shit. But mm-hmm. the other thing what I, that was brought up which was interesting is he said he thinks Biden, you know, is keeping this issue at arm's length and letting and you know with the Schumer legislation sort of leaving it over there. Um, but if it passes, he'll have to make a decision of whether or not he wants yeah. to be the disclosure president. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, yeah, I said, yeah, we'll know pretty quickly mm-hmm. if Biden wants to be the disclosure president. And which took me a little by surprise because I was going on the assumption that because this legislation was, according to uh, Schumer, was written in consultation with the executive branch, yeah, uh, I don't know that that Biden was in in on the discussions. So I was going on the assumption that well, I guess well, Biden must be, you know, he's a, must be aware and must be uh you know, uh open to this happening. Uh but but how, you know, but I, you know, if Hal Putoff says the opposite then he's probably more knowledgeable and definitely smarter than me. So Yeah, I don't think there's any question of that. Um no yeah. offense. Well, uh well, he's- me also i couldn't even figure out isotopes earlier um uh, the um the the thing is that what was very clear uh or at least was being said repeatedly or suggested that the congress was pushing for disclosure and the executive was resisting disclosure and that that seemed, yeah that would seem to be what hal, hal was getting at yeah that uh they there are senators and reps that want to know they know their shit's being kept from them. The executive knows it's keeping things from them. Uh, doesn't want to give up the goods with, from these various agencies. So there is that. That would, to me, was beginning to crystallize and help me understand wh- what what sort of re- the signals that we've been getting are so weird from the government. You have like Arrow set up, which is, as Chris Mellon explained, a completely kind of counterintuitive. It, it is not built for disclosure. It's it's essentially a, a sort of re, revamp of Blue Book, this sort of mm-hmm. like, okay, we're going to look like we're doing stuff, but not actually yeah. do any stuff, and we're going to minimize yeah. it as much yeah. as possible. That, that Sean Kirkpatrick can only say what DOD authorizes him to say. Yes. So they seem incurious about the most obviously uh, gobsmacking information coming out from Grush and everyone else. So they're... Mm-hmm. So that is a sort of executive yeah. branch sort of endeavor where you have the Congress having the hearings, trying to get everything out and seeming trying to talk about it as much as possible. So that would make sense that you've got two branches of government more or less vying for control over this topic. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. And it's, th- yeah, the fact that there's, what's the term, internecine, uh, some sort of warfare competition yeah, there's a yeah going on in within within the government within branches of the government about what what the people should know or not know or or maybe just what you know some politicians don't want to have to deal with mhm um mm-hmm. and that uh that was day 1 that was day 1 that takes us yep with uh yes with that that bunch and Larry McGuire um, well, there you go. And that would have been to... Lou Elizondo was supposed to be in that panel, but he couldn't make it because of uh, family obligation. I know it would have been really, really cool to uh, yeah to see him, but hopefully everything's yeah, okay like, with yeah. his with yeah. his family. And um, the next day, we may not get to all of day two on this uh, session, but there were a couple cool interactions. Like for instance, we got a little bolder. We started to meet some folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, or started to. I was like, "Damn it, I'm gonna I'm gonna make some connections here. I'm gonna." Uh, we met Chris Mellon that morning of day two, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it was interesting. I, I asked him what he thought we should um, – I would love to have him on the podcast. But I asked him yes. what we – what people like us should be talking about or what's not being talked about enough with this issue. And he said, uh, should we disclose? And yeah, and when we get to this, when we move on to the day two, he d- – gave a talk that I think got everyone a little scared. Yes. In the room. Yeah. 
uh, about the you know he started discussing what are what is the downsides of the downside of disclosure what is the negative potential of disclosure and we need to we need to face it head on and be aware of it when we make our decisions about what we're what we think we should be doing with this information and that was that was a very interesting conversation. Yeah, he was talking about that he wrestled with the ethics of bringing David Grush out. Uh, he was also instrumental in getting the footage of yeah, um, the three famous the, the, for the big twenty seventeen article. I suppose was one of the ones that he was yeah, really the, the, uh, bringing yeah, Luella's the video, the Go Fast, yeah. and then and the uh, the gimbal. But he was kept up nights, kind of wrestling with am I doing the right thing here, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, getting this information out and what are the ramifications of it? Even in his speech, he still seemed to be wrestling with it because he was, it felt to me, he was going a little back and forth. Like we've got to be extremely mm -hmm. cautious and careful and should we, or shouldn't we? And then he came out all for disclosure. So I was like, okay, well, I guess he sort of worked it out for himself. But yeah. I th yeah. I think that was his design. He wanted to get people worried that worried of what direction he was going. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah. Um, yeah, cause I think afterwards I, I went up to him and said, you know, I think you, I think you scared a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, that was deliberate. Okay. And I said, oh, I, I thought so. What I, I, I feel like the genie's out of the bottle. Um, the to yeah. toothpaste is out of the tube. I don't know how you don't disclose at this point. Yeah. And that seemed to be the overall theme was just how is, what is the best most uh careful and considerate way to to share this and i think the problem is is that i've i have i have wondered may well maybe they just don't know you know what the hell this stuff is um that might mm -hmm. partially be still true but uh my growing concern is that they might know what some of this is and what yeah. the and what they may perceive some motives or agendas that would be particularly upsetting to people. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and that, you know, and that the, uh, the acceleration towards disclosure, you know, it may be the product of a, uh, of a schedule that's been put in motion uh, that uh, is not a human schedule. This I bump on, and you've said this a lot. I, I find it hard to believe that a, that ET or non-human intelligence keep any sort of calendar. And if and if and if disclosure matters at all, like if they're just going to come and and turn us into a farm, like what the fuck difference does disclosure make? I mean, they're just going to do it. I mean, disclosure suggests that we have some uh, stake in this and that we have some say in this, and how we handle it is critical. Like it seemed to me, and I want to hear any your your you know uh, uh, any counter argument to this but i'm just like it seemed to me the discussion was what will we do to ourselves in light of the fact that wh whatever our our the foundations mm -hmm. of our religion are shaken or the you know the that we might not like the that our origin story is not what we thought it might be or that the you know i, I think it's yeah the problem is we might under the hot light of truth we might not like those truths and it just might be too jarring and society might not be able to withstand it versus for example i don't know what i what i get from this 2027 talk which is like i don't know they just show up in a gigantic you know ship and we're like i don't know like suddenly there's well, two delis really, one I has non-human intelligence deli and the other one like i don't know is it we're suddenly alien nation i'm not sure what the I don't know. Well, that's the thing is it could be, you know, you know, it's the one thing that I keep realizing more and er, over and over again is that all the things I used to think, well, at least I don't have to believe that. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. As I progress, uh, all of those things keep being taken away from me. All mm -hmm. the things I think I don't have to believe, you know, you know. Um, so. The. You know, the fact seem, it does seem like, you know, whatever these non-human intelligences are, they are interacting with us, you know, because a part of this story is um, the abduction story, mm -hmm. um, the visitation story. It is, um, you know, things like, um, you know, the aerial school phenomena, mm -hmm. you know, interact actual interactions mm -hmm. um, with these entities. So it's not. Uh, inconceivable that 
that there has been some sort of a plan, uh, some sort of a timeline, and some sort of um, an idea of uh, acclimatizing, perhaps, the population. You know, which is one of the things that Carl Nell yeah. talked about in his talk was what is the timeline for where we how we get from uh, where we are right now, which is most people not thinking about it at all. Right. To a world where everyone is on a daily basis in their reality, knowledgeable of the fact that there are non-human intelligences on the planet right which may us. yes which may imply uh a much uh, may, may imply a greater sense of of interaction necessary i, I mean i still think the the sheer uh, I, I mean because this appears to have been an ancient phenomenon you know that uh i'm always a little leery i don't know it always i've lived now through y2k 2012 19 i've lived through a few we both have you know a few of these sort of like watch out dates and and mm -hmm. you know i'm and i hope i continue to live through these, you know, these yeah. dates and it could but, be wishful thinking whistling past the graveyard but it did feel like this would be on us uh, on how to respond yeah. and that um if if for example if agency is taken away from us, it doesn't disclosure doesn't matter. Um, but well, it's, it's well, I, I guess it matters in terms. It it still matters in terms of if we're being given time to be prepared, if we're giving time to minimize the disruption. Um, yeah. Disclosure still how how disclosure happens. Um, you know, it's one of the conversations that, from day two. Um, uh, what was his name? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there was uh oh yes the, the that university of hawaii professor uh, yes. he was all about uh basically he has uh, uh, disclosure yeah, his his yeah his field is, he does he he tries to put together potential futures mm -hmm. tries to outline what possible futures are based on current knowledge mm -hmm. and basically he came up with four potential futures that all ended in catastrophic disclosure yeah that all ended in in chaos mm -hmm. Uh, which I think so disclosure is like yeah. you know, you you roll the ship out of the out of the barn and you say here it is guys or yeah. one one country does it and all the other countries freak out and and so yeah. forth and yeah. listen we're we're a, we're a stupid people um, there's no yeah. question of how many different ways we could fuck this up just on our own we don't need the help of non human intelligence to to screw up disclosure but I don't know my takeaway yeah. was still that this is kind of our problem to figure out. Um, Particularly, yeah, if we're dealing with this. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm uh, uh, J Jairus Victor Grove, PhD from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That was his talk. Crowded skies, atmospheric and orbital threat reduction in the age of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so that's his name. My God, we're not even at the bottom of page one of day two. Dave, we might do. We might might have to do a recap this, of a, 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 another pod recapping. Yeah. Or we can just speckle in I our recaps, so. but the. Um, the one thing that I thought, first of all, Tim Galladay was, um, yeah, the retired admiral, real admiral, uh, former uh, headed uh, NOAA, yeah, the, the Climate uh, uh, Ocean Agency, the uh, yes, National Oceanographic and I don't, I can't remember what all the acronyms stand for. There were a no, lot of acronyms, basically. but it was cool shit. Yeah. I mean, he was in charge basically, of the weather. They, yes, the weather and the oceans. Um, Yes, and his field now is he is uh, very concerned about um, U.S. Uh, U.S.O. Um, you know things under the ocean. He was um, talking about one of his superiors um, during a huge mission. They they you know because he was in charge of just a fleet of ships and you know and mm -hmm. personnel and and support ships and like this he is was. Yeah, he was off the East Coast during the uh, all the sightings uh, that Ryan Graves yeah. disclosed, uh, and, um, and he he recorded that there was an email that went out to him and to everybody because these things were everywhere, and it said, "If any of you know what these are, tell me now, because we are having near misses with uh, 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 almost every flight." And this email went out, and and it was. Um, yeah, the same mission Ryan Graves was on when they were experiencing yeah, this. Just, yeah, off the coast of Virginia, I think it was, in, in, a, in a, a, a staging ground mm -hmm. for training before going into uh, active 
um, active uh, uh, war zones. And the next and day, they, the email was wiped. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and no one discussed it. And the next day in the meeting, nobody brought it up. And he goes, yeah. oh, this is an SAP. He he knew what that meant. This meant that he had they had just brushed up against some secret ac access program. And and he was angry about the overclassification that was going on because this is this was endangering pilots. He was like, "What the fuck is going on? This is yeah. you know this is a danger to pilots, but we don't know what it is, and they're classifying it, and we can't figure it out, and they won't tell us. And if we say anything, you know, you get blacklisted and you'll get you know in trouble. Um, yeah, career ending. Mm -hmm. He is doing. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying, and and so he was there at the time when Ryan Graves was was flying. And they were having to scrub missions, like training missions, because they were, had too many UFOs in the air. Uh, and these were the UFOs that were described by – that were visually uh, spotted by pilots and described them as a, uh, a dark cube inside a translucent sphere, you know, where, where the you – know, the, where the, uh, the corners of the cube touch the uh, exterior, you know, the, or the interior walls of this translucent sphere. And that these things were hanging – motionless in the air in uh category four st hurricane strength winds uh for hours just hanging there without without like as though they were sitting on a rock uh in the middle of the sky in category four hurricane winds uh and in case you're wondering uh listeners or viewers that's impossible <laughs> Uh, nothing we have can do that. Uh, that, you know, when we go up and we're in the, you know, it's like when, if you jump in a river, the river's going to move you in one direction and you have to exert a lot of energy to stay in one place. If you're in a river, mm -hmm. if you've ever swum in a river, you know, it's exhausting. Um, and these things were just stock still in, in these, in these incredibly strong winds. Uh, and then they would suddenly depart at hypersonic speeds without without any um signature without any sonic booms his his entire thing is uh is the underwater uh uaps uh yeah and that's really cool uh he really wants to yes. put together the same he wants essentially a galileo project for the oceans um there's yes. a guy named and he is and he's working with Ryan Graves. He's working with Ryan Graves. He's working with a guy named Victor Vescovo, who is sort of the Neil Armstrong of the oceans and in terms of mapping the deep ocean trenches, who is yes. helping him, you know, wants to look for uh, UAPs, uh, USOs, I suppose they're called. Yes. And they actually sent him out to look for something off the coast of uh, San Diego, uh, where the San Diego. Tic Tacs are. Yeah. Um, and, and he apparently and found something. He, yeah. Uh, yes. That appears to something a little unexplainable. Well, he says yeah. he found uh, there's essentially sort of a mountain wall, and he found like a wedged piece of rock that has been taken out about a kilometer. <laughs> this colossal and dropped off. Yeah, uh, about two kilometers away, like this boulder was was moved like a wedge, um, and did yeah. not look in any way explicable through natural phenomenon. But yeah, it's not, it's not how things move under the ocean. Typically, no, like huge. Huge heavy rocks don't just get swept up and moved somewhere. And they have not Natural. had a chance to sort of look in to see what is under that kind of wedge space. But some of the other stuff that – some of the other stuff he said, he said the White House does not want disclosure. And that is why that disconnect is happening. That why – as we discussed earlier, he was another one yeah. saying, you know. Um, and it was funny about the overclassification – they, this was what was so cool about the audience because everybody in the audience is like, he, he pointed to Chris Mellon. He's like, Chris, what's going on with the overclassification of these military photos? And Chris Mellon, who I guess is in touch with all these people regarding who's classifying and not classifying, said that more and better imagery of the Nimitz sightings uh, are coming soon. He didn't mm -hmm. know how clear they would be allowed to go or get. Yes. Said it wouldn't be the best stuff they have, but it will be better. But they was just, just talking with the, and these were, uh, come on, these, this, this was like, this room was filled with like Illuminati. I mean, come on. I, I just like, uh, you know, yeah. Chris Mellon has a very interesting, very nice guy. Um, uh, we would love to have him on pod anytime. Yeah. Any of these people, Tim Galladay, yeah. we want to have on. Tim Galladay would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. We, we met some folks who, who seem to, we think we'll have some wonderful guests as a result of this visit because, um, uh, 
I, I will share, and then we should probably wrap up this round of of our yes, I guess uh, yes of our Saul recap. But I, so I kind of worked up the uh, the courage to say hi to Whitley Strieber. Um, uh, yeah. Some call Whitley Strieber. I'm not sure if it's Strieber or Strieber, but yeah. so I went up to him and I said uh, I thanked him for a letter that he sent to me um, many years ago when I was 15 because I had read Communion. And uh, was profoundly impacted by it. I and it wasn't because I had been abducted or anything. I was mm-hmm. um, I had been like a lucid dreamer, and you know I had my ghost stories. And I just wanted to like be in the conversation. It was just I felt an incredible connection to the book. So um, yeah. he was very sweet and was like, "Thank you." And he had written me back, um, just being like, "Yeah, Tom, you know, like lots of people are, who knows what this is and whatever." But uh, I felt a part of the community then. And uh, he thanked me for like sharing that with him. And we sort of talked for a minute. And um, it was definitely a cool moment because my mom had passed a couple of years ago. And I knew she was like, would be totally into that exchange because mm-hmm. she was just sort of so kind of uh, into that. And she would have loved this entire, this entire mind blowing weekend. She just would have been so, and was there. I could, you know, um, there was also a fabulous rainbow that I pointed out to you several times until yes. I, I started to feel like maybe. Maybe I pointed out one too many times, but it was, <laughs> it was you were like, at one point you were like, yeah, I see it. I see the rainbow, Tom. Mm-hmm. I, was like, we're, <laughs> like, I was like, okay, all right, I'm getting a little too excited about it. But um, yeah, we, uh, there's more to discuss here. Uh, like the Carl Nell talk in itself could, could take up uh, uh, an yeah. hour because there's a lot yeah. to unpack there. So, um, hey. We should do this again. We should start a podcast uh, All right. on this topic. All right, but it's kind of cliche. I agree. Podcasting it's getting a little it's it's a little old, but um, you know, yep. we're here. We've got. I bought the mic. F- yes, finally, made things so much better. Yeah, made things so much easier. I know. So I yeah. figured out finally how to get all this stuff tech going. But it would be good yeah. to see you in person again. That was fun. Yeah, our weekends are fun yeah. with with you and Chrissy, and we're whooping it up. So that so we we still have we still got some we still got we still got about a half a page, but we'll come back. to uh, it. Listen, there's only so many mysteries of the universe we can solve in one yeah. podcast. I think this we've, is, this is, we've blown lot, some minds. There's a lot in this pamphlet. We've blown some fucking minds today. Yeah. And we uh, we will continue to uh, recap. We'll be recapping this. I'll be recapping these this weekend for the rest of my life. Okay. I'm going to be. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to be. No, this was, this was truly, this was truly, we, 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 we were privileged to be uh, present at what I think is truly, is going to be uh, held up as an historic event. It, for quite some time. It was amazing to be there. Yeah, it was yeah. an extraordinary kind of grouping of individuals who have, you know, been at this for a good long while, who have been yeah. uh just huge in terms of moving the story and the and it is it remains unbelievable to me. Yeah. And yet yeah. uh yeah. like I said we said at the beginning, like disclosure is well underway. And we we may have had the opportunity to be a part of history very near the end of human history. <laughs> well, and that's the wonderful... We want to leave that with you on this, in these holidays, <laughs> this, this approaching holiday. Have yourself a merry <laughs> yeah. little last Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to take the Avi Loeb approach. It's all positive. It's all good. We're going to learn new technology. It's going to change our future. AI is going to be friendly. We're going to raise it right. It's going to make friends with the whatever it is. Uh, we're mm-hmm. going to keep on trucking. We are a flawed but uh, enduring uh, sentient <laughs> sentience. We're a human we're we're, human we're intelligence. Nice. There's some really good stuff about our species. Come on, it's all oh. you know. There's let's let's we and, can yeah. list them. Some of us, some of us look great naked. Yeah, I mean that's something. Yeah, I don't know. If I those mean, two I'm not are one of them. Yeah, there's sure. there are people out there that just oh going Doing all the way back to the Romans and the Greeks. Doing my best. Oh um, my God. Hey, listen, you're a good man. That's what you I'll too, say. Tom. As human intelligences go, I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad we. Man. I'm glad the three of us got to share this this weekend mm-hmm. uh, in in. Uh, up at Stanford. Yep. And, uh, you know, and a lot to think about, a lot of interesting people that we met and, uh, 
more to come. Leave your questions, like and subscribe to really at really with Tom and Dave on our YouTube channel. And thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, Adam. Check our Instagram. We uh, we will catch you. And thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone over at Stampede who made this possible. Yes, yes, for us to make this trip amazing. So uh, lots yeah. more to discuss, and uh, I look forward to uh, our next one, buddy. Yeah, and please learn to love us, Gary Nolan. Please.